So greetings all. I'm Michelle Thompson, W5NYV. I'm here to talk about a shortened HF antenna project. And this is from Open Research Institute. It's a nonprofit that does open source digital radio work, uh, primarily for amateur radio. And this project reflects the work of a lot of people. The design dates back to over 65 years ago. The presentation has three parts the past history and references about this design, a present day simulation and prototype, and ideas for future work. When we talk about shortened high frequency antennas, generally meaning designs for three to 30 megahertz, there are things that we take for granted, and there's a lot that we can learn from the past. Whenever we physically shorten an antenna, which we as modern amateur radio operators often want or need to do, then we are dealing with compromised antennas, and we have to make some trade-offs, reducing size, costs, performance. Now, I like this paper that's cited here on this slide. It's from 1960 because it states the problem space in a way that I understood and could appreciate. Antenna size affects your gain, your bandwidth, and your efficiency. And this paper is one that we have at ORI in a publicly available collection for this project on GitHub. And the link to that collection or repository is in the slides, uh, along with all of the design files and the practical results. Because this is an open source project, you can access all of these files and participate in the project. And there's lots of ways it can be improved and expanded. Now you may know about the iron triangle of project management, where you have budget, scope, and schedule. And quality is constrained by these three features. And you might have heard, you can be good, fast, or cheap, choose two. Traditional waterfall project development fixes the scope and then the budget, and schedule can vary and balance each other out. Agile projects have a fixed schedule and budget, and the scope varies. Antenna design has similar trade-offs and similar design patterns, where we have to balance our size, our bandwidth, our gain, and our radiation efficiency to get a compromise that we can live with. This balancing act is, uh, is very fun, as anybody that's ever played around with antennas can, can attest. So there are three major strategies for reducing the size of an antenna. We can modify the structure physically. We can use electrical components or lumped elements. And we can use high permittivity materials. Structural modifications can be divided up into three major categories. We can use slots or slits. Those of you that, that have done microwave band operation may have seen antennas that, that use slots or slits. Uh, we can use fractals. Um, these are usually pretty small on PCBs. And we can use meanders. So we're going to use meanders. Lumped elements include inductors, capacitors, and resistors. And you have probably seen a capacitive hat or a coil included in a vertical whip. These electrical components change the electrical length of an antenna. And finally, dielectrics or high permittivity materials can move the resonant frequency of an antenna, which has the same effect as changing the physical size of the antenna. This is a very common technique with antennas made with printed circuit boards. Meanders provide something called linear loading. Now here's a great web page by M0PZT, who describes this as folding the wire back on itself. We reduce the overall length of the antenna, but this is not the same thing as an inductor or a coil. This is one of the earliest papers about this type of meander dipole for HF. It's from the Radio Society of Great Britain newsletter in 1958. The article is by an MJ Heaviside, G2QM. This article can be found in the paper's directory at the link in the slides. He does refer to the folded part as a loading coil, but to be very clear, we are not making a coil, we are making meanders. Decades later, Monty Northrup and 5ESE designed and built a portable hotel room friendly version of this antenna, and he published a fantastic web notebook about it. So here's a drawing of what he built and used. Uh, here's the template and a photograph, a template for the copper tape, this copper tape template. So he used copper tape for the meanders. All of these are also available 
uh, directly from Monty's website, and we captured a PDF version of the page for safekeeping in the project GitHub. So there's a pretty strong indication from the papers that this antenna works pretty well. Never underestimate old newsletters or old papers as a source of excellent ideas. And in the present day, when you're doing things, do not fail to write down the things that you experiment with, even if you don't have the time to do a perfect job or a complete analysis, because you never know when someone decades in the future will have the time and they will deeply appreciate your work. This is the magic of citizen science and true amateur spirit. It doesn't have to be complete or perfect to contribute to the advancement of the practical radio arts. So we wanted to build a prototype and then see if it could be mass produced. Today's amateur operators often have very limited space. We've talked about this several times here at Rat Pack. Or your neighborhoods might have rules. Or you, you may have the, the space and you may not have any rules, but you may just not be able to afford a tall tower. So first we simulated the design. Initial results from the Washington DC volunteers in a program called MMANA were good. So a model in MATLAB was written and published. So we're gonna walk through that model and we're gonna explain it. We then constructed an antenna using the dimensions from N5ESE's documentation. And then finally, we took some initial measurements of the prototype and we're gonna present them here. So all of this work is in a publicly available repository in GitHub, and the link is, is here on this page. The structure of the repository is shown here with the MATLAB-based model and results in one directory, the simulations and photographs and field testing from Washington DC-based volunteers in another directory, and then technical articles and papers in the papers directory. Now, there may be additional directories or changes to the directory structure, but what we do is we uh, update the home page for the repository uh, and explain which uh, which directory is what. And as of today, I think that is is still a very accurate snapshot of the uh, structure. So we call this project dumbbell because the antenna design roughly resembles like a weightlifter's dumbbell. Um, if you can come up with a better name, then you just let us know. So we start out by duplicating the introductory model in the 1958 paper. So in the introduction of 1958 paper, it talks about um, a 256 foot long aerial. And we did this so we could get a decent handle on the theory. The model that is 256 feet long uses sine x squared to represent the radiate power of the short sections of a half wave antenna. Uh, the x-axis is the electrical distance from the free end, and the area under the curve uh, represents the radiation resistance of the part of the aerial represented by that part of the curve. And that's the curve. So all of that code builds up to this point. Now, this is an easy curve to plot, but labeling the graph actually takes some efforts, and this, is, uh, this part of the script handles, handles the labels. So you can see it uh, along the bottom is uh, is length. We color in sections of the curve to illustrate the points made in the paper. Their x-axis here is expressed in radians and not in feet. We rotate through a half wave. So we go from zero to pi radians, a full wave being two pi. And this makes our MATLAB model a little bit more general than the one that was in the paper. So the question posed in the paper is, what if we could make the end piece, that piece in cyan there on the on the left, what if we could act that, make that piece right there, act like the middle piece colored in green? You can see that we get much better radiation resistance in the green section than in cyan. Each section is the same length of wire, but one is providing a lot more oomph than the other. The key idea from this paper is that we are manipulating radiation resistance. All right, so what is radiation resistance? Well, we know that a good antenna moves most of the power that we send to it out over the air. That, that's pretty basic, that makes sense. A bad antenna eats up some of the power. We call a bad antenna inefficient because it's not working very hard for us. Antenna efficiency is the ratio of the radiated power divided by the power we are putting into it from the power supply. Okay. So far, so good, it's just a ratio. So radiation resistance is the amount of resistance that we need in order to create that radiated power. 
We also have total antenna efficiency. Uh, that's it there at the bottom, uh, which is where we take our antenna efficiency and then account for the power lost due to impedance mismatch. It should make sense to you that you want as little friction as possible for those waves to travel from the radio into the wire. So we can think of impedance mismatch as how easy it is to open a door to leave a house. You can lose a bit of momentum or power if you're constantly tripping over the badly installed door frame on the way out. And a truly terrible antenna is like not being able to open the door or get out into the world at all. The door is jammed and you're not leaving. So when we talk about radiation resistance, this is an indication of how well the antenna can radiate power out into the world. So the paper continues to compare the green portion, that 57 feet in the center of the aerial, to the 120 feet measured from the very end. OK, so I'll, I'll go back up to the green. OK, so the paper says, hey, take that green green part the highest, highest part in the antenna, and then we're going to compare it to half from, from the end uh, up to the center. They're actually pretty close in performance if you measure the area under the curve. So I copied over N5ESE's comments from his page to the comments in the script and, and thought about them for a while. I captured the antenna length of his notebook antenna as a variable in the script just in case. So we want higher radiation resistance while being shorter. This is a pretty good explanation of what we're after on N5 ESE site. So let's model his design in MATLAB, build it, and test it. Now, there's a lot of different ways to, to model things. Uh, all models are wrong, and some are useful, according to a man named George Box. He's yet another smart British person. He was a famous and accomplished statistician. So I decided to start to start out and parameterizing this design with a frequency, then calculated the wavelength, divided it into six parts to get a half-wave dipole segmented into three sections. The outer two-thirds would then be folded up into the meanders, those little back and forth and back and forth sections, little zigzags. This part of the script gives the length of the two meanders and the radiating part of the wire. So I set them all equal to each other. But this is something that could be varied in the model to look for optimizations and improvements. All of the papers and, and the newsletter folks, they say it doesn't matter much, that you can, you can make the antenna fit the area. Uh, but I went ahead and divided it up evenly. OK, so now we have these zigzags. And we keep seeing keep at least one inch gap over and over again in these papers. Now, there's no explanation for this. So it's another thing on the list to test out in future work. Now, if any of this sounds like fun to you, well, then welcome aboard. This notch length that we called was uh, set to an inch, uh, but we had to convert it into meters because MATLAB uses the metric system. So we have our, our notch length, and we know how much wire that we want to fold up. And we want it to kind of be squarish in shape. Uh, so how many times can we go back and forth if we zigzag with a one-inch gap? We want to find out the number of humps in the folded section. And we can use the quadratic equation to get that result. Here's the whiteboard session where we figured this out. Thank you very much to Lab Tech One, one of our student interns at ORI, for doing a great job here. Now, we got a result. Uh, but as you might have guessed, it's not an integer number. It's something like 5.34 humps to use up all that wire. But we want the wire to end at the edge of the rectangle and not like halfway up. We want that last fold to be complete. You know, and if it's not, well, who knows what will happen then? Well, maybe nothing, but we want it nice and neat with a, and we can do that with a small extra step. We set the number of humps to the floor of the value we just calculated, which is just a fancy way of saying we're gonna round down. Then we recalculate the height and the width of the folded section while keeping the spacing between the wires at one inch. Well, not too bad. So now we're going to make a birdcage style structure on the end, like the 1958 paper proposed for outdoor use. So we need to know how far apart the spacers are and their diameter. Now we have all these values at this point in the script. Calculating the spacer or cowling diameter is really easy. We're making a toothed gear and we're lacing the wire back and forth over alternating teeth. We're essentially taking that rectangular flat zigzag meanders and we're wrapping it around some toothed gears to make a, a bird cage, and the original paper suggested that this was uh, more durable and would be easier to, to string up outdoors. 
So minor issue, our wire will follow the cord behind the tooth and not the arc of the circle. No problem. We just take this into account in the script and we grow the disc a tiny bit to compensate. Now this doesn't matter much for small structures like the one that we're making from N5ESE, uh, where it's about a foot by a foot for the folded section. But for larger antennas, um, like what we'll probably need for 160 meters, it might make a difference. And again, something we can play around with in future work. So now we take our calculations to MATLAB's antenna designer. The meander dipole model looks like the shape we need. We configure this model with our calculated measurements and then show our results using functions and visualizations in MATLAB's RF toolbox. So first we just show the physical model of the antenna. Uh, so far, so good. And then we convert that basic model to something called a wire stack model. And this moves the model from the original printed circuit board trace model style to a wire antenna model with the right type of feed point. So here's a wire stack. And then that's a close-up of the, of the folded section. So, so far, so good. This is good. And now we're going to run through some more visualizations. So we get impedance, uh, wideband, uh, wideband and detail to run the zero crossing point, and antenna pattern, and some other things. So let's see what we got here. There's our impedance. And, uh, you know, that actually looks, looks like what we expected. There's a close-up of the, the crossing point. That's a zero crossing point. And here is the antenna pattern. That's kind of neat. That's that's pretty much what we expected. But the efficiency, um, it, MATLAB proudly declared it to be one. That actually is a result. It's a uh, one all the way up at the top. It was uh, not reasonable. What are you doing, MATLAB? And let's see. Here's charge density uh, with a lot at the feed point and very end of the wire. Current intensity. And then Paul Williamson, uh, KB5MU, asked for a Smith chart. Uh, as a digital signal processing person, this is kind of outside my comfort zone, but there's no time like the present to learn how to do something. So here it is. This is over 23 to 28 megahertz because it looks like that was an interesting part of the simulation. Now, we only had coax to work with at first, so we learned how to add coax transmission line to the model. It's pretty neat. We made a coax model and then treated it like a load on the antenna, and then we simulated SWR. Then finally, we found a really nice bit of an animation from the MATLAB community, which was posted in their forums. And the code that does this, sort of visual, visualizing the uh, uh, electric field, um, that all of that code is available on our in our GitHub. Okay, so enough talk. Let's build. Okay, first we need some spacers to lace up the folded part of the antenna. So I used OpenSCAD and our calculated dimensions to make an STL model. Uh, that's a 3D model format. The, the STL is the extension. So when you hear people say STL model, it's .STL. That's, that's what that is. Uh, these models are in the re repository as well. Uh, it's the source code and uh, a the output of the STL that we used. A big thanks to Mark Whittington for 3D printing these spacers and suggesting that an inch thick was overkill. Uh, it does really work better at half an inch thick uh, or laser cut acrylic is another way to do this. And so here's our design drawings. We use PVC pipe to support uh, the antenna wire. The spacers could go over the PVC pipe and then get pinned into place. Then the wire can be laced back and forth and secured at the end by anchoring it through a hole in the spacer uh, with a nut and bolt. There wasn't anything in this design to prevent it from rotating, but my Fetaham friends on Mastodon.radio were of the opinion that it probably wouldn't matter much and to just go ahead and try it out with a friction fit and straight pins. And they were right. So as an aside, if you're if you're looking for an inclusive and friendly Mastodon server, then Mastodon.radio is a great fit. It's administered by Christopher M0YNG, yet another British person doing great things in radio. So we machine holes in 3D printed parts so we could slip them over the PVC pipe. And then we put the mast and the boom together with a truss to hold up the PVC, otherwise it's a bit droopy. We uh, test fit the cowlings, uh, and that test fitting with the boom went really pretty well. So here it is, 
coming together. Here's how the pinning was done. This was done with a heavy copper wire and a drill. Now lacing the wire went pretty well, although we did get a bit too enthusiastic with the second one and crunched the spacer into the pin. So we took it back off and rotated it uh, to get away from the damage and then laced it back up. So the interior of this of a 3D print like this is honeycombed um, or has a rectangular uh, back and forth walls, set of walls. It's not solid unless you print it solid. It's actually stronger um, at, with with the interior honeycomb, but the surface can be fragile. Um, so this is a prototype and not something that you should deploy like long term. Uh, but those of you listening to this know uh, that uh, short term means it'll go up and temporarily stay up for like five years. You all know the drill. Here it is up and connected with coax because that's what we had on hand. Now we knew it would behave well near 22 dot something megahertz. So we picked the closest band to that. We connected it up to a flex radio, and we did a side-by-side -side comparison to a 40-foot vertical in the same location. And this is the results on the screen using um, Smart SDR. Now, we took a side trip with a nano VNA. The SWR curve looked like the one in MATLAB. And maybe the Smith chart does too, but all three of us were digital communications people, uh, me, Lab Tech One, and, and Paul Williamson. So we were thrilled just to get something that didn't look like cotton candy on the monitor. We found out that you can use the Nano VNA to find out the length of your coax. So we did that. And then I was able to update the MATLAB model with the exact length of coax. Now, this sort of feedback between reality and model, math land, you know, is super fun. And it improves the model in the process. Now, we had an intermission. Uh, due to Hurricane Hillary, we brought the dumbbell inside, uh, only suffered minor damage to two trees. And a big thanks to John Barcroft, K6AM. We, uh, we got some twin lead. Paul swapped in the twin lead for the coax and then did uh, Paul did some archaeology and uncovered his Halicrafter's tuner. We used uh, Flex Radio 6000 and a laptop running Smart SDR on a MacBook Air connected directly to the radio. After some field repairs to the tuner, uh, we realized that we needed a wider view of SDR of SWR to uh, to tune this thing. So I brought over an inline meter that did the trick. The inline meter is on the far right. The Halicrafters tuner that we used for this is in the middle, and that's the view of the antenna from the uh, testing station on the left. All right, so here is yeah, here's the results. So I'm just gonna to go ahead and page through these slowly. And then at the end, there is a summary chart. So this is just putting a tune on and then looking at SWR. Okay, and here's the summary chart. So not bad. That's what we were after is to sort of see if this actually uh, would, would tune up. Okay, so how much has this cost so far? Well, there was one trip to the hardware store, and it was less than $100. We got uh, a pile of PVC, uh, the fittings, a patio umbrella stand, which is our go-to for things like LNBs on sticks and other microwave doohickeys. This is not a stable platform for installation, by the way, but it serves pretty well to get an antenna up for testing as long as the wind doesn't blow very hard. And all of the other stuff we had in stock uh, or we got from Open Research Institute. So interest grew after I shared some of the initial results and started talking about this antenna. So a special thank you to N0MQL and N6CTA for the advice and encouragement. One of the most fun things about any paper or project is uh, the future work. And there is a lot to do. Um, you've heard go big or go home. And we have go big and go home. We want to nail down a version of this antenna that will do 160 meters pretty well in a small enough size to where ordinary people can enjoy it and the other and other bands. So one that can do 160 meters uh, is the next target. You could see that this is a multi-band antenna. N5 ESE had success with multi-band. Other people that have, have put it up as multi-band, but it, it there is a limit. So the design does 
I think we're going to have to change the design to go to 160 meters. So several people are drawing up plans and working on it. And I can't wait to help support that and build a prototype uh, of that here in San Diego. In addition to the optimizations concerning like the folded wire spacing and exactly how much shortening you can get away with, uh, we probably need to figure out why MATLAB thinks the efficiency is one. Uh, maybe one of you uh, wonderful people here at Rat Pack knows and can explain it to me so we can add that to the script. Uh, and the spacer design can be improved. Using the winding wire over toothed gears approach is okay, but lacing the wire through holes in a disc might improve the alignment and make it look neater. And a notch to fit over a pin would secure the disc with respect to rotation. So we have a saying at ORI, you do not have to be uh, an expert to join. You just have to be willing to become more of one along the way. So check out our Getting Started page and feel free to follow along with any of our many projects. Thank you, everybody. And I'm happy to talk, talk in tennis, uh, talk about the project, answer questions. And uh, I really appreciate everybody being here tonight. Chat is quiet, Dan. You want to have hands? Yeah, I think I saw some hands. Okay, I, I have myself muted. <laughs> All right. Gene, come on, do your thing. <laughs> All right, yes, Michelle, good evening from uh, Clean, Texas. Very good. Outstanding presentation. My question is concerning MATLAB. I've heard a lot about it over the years, but I really don't know anything about it. What is the learning curve like on using that effectively? Oh, what a great question. Uh, I've been using MATLAB for many years and still don't know how to use it. So any uh, powerful, flexible tool um, there's, it's going to exact a, a cost in terms of learning curve. Um, so, so MATLAB is in that category of it can be pretty pretty difficult. Um, however, it's uh, been beat on for decades, and it actually does have some uh, the MATLAB, the company or MathWorks, the company that that uh, makes MATLAB. They have some excellent free training, so free tutorials that will take you from nothing to being pretty decent at it. Now, having said that, it's really used very heavily and in, in like what I do uh, for digital signal processing and for uh, for things like that. Um, if you're, you could do a lot of this in Python. Um, you can do most of what I did in um, an open source package called Octave if you're willing to write uh, some of the stuff yourself. Uh, some of the visualizations uh, are, don't quite match up. Um, so there, there are different ways to model antennas. Uh, also, you could just use antenna modeling like EasyNeck or, or one of those uh, if you were just, just out after uh, doing antenna modeling. So yes, Matt, you know, MATLAB's amazing. I'm, I'm a big fan, uh, but it is uh, a complicated tool. Um, with, the, with the free training from MathWorks, it is achievable to get up and running um, you know, with, within a, a week or two you know, of steady kind of hitting it. If you've ever done any sort of computer programming before, the scripts are going to look very, very familiar to you. All right. Thank you a lot for that information. That was very helpful. Yeah. Open SCAD, the thing that's that I used for 3D modeling is similar because uh, unlike like Fusion 360 or some of the graphical user interface things where you make 3D models with a mouse, Open SCAD is where you describe it mathematically or you describe it with shapes. Um, so it's a it's a scripting language as well. So those are, that's a, another, another uh, a tool that was in there. All right, great, thank you. All right. Of course. I don't see any more hands for the moment. So Barry, how are we doing in chat? We're doing pretty good. I think you just addressed this, Michelle. Uh, can you address Octave? And yes, yes Oxford? I can. Yeah, Octave is a open source, so free and open source version of MATLAB. And a, a couple of decades ago, they were extremely close in terms of, of performance that you could go back and forth between them. Um, MATLAB has added a whole ton of stuff uh, the, and, and has 
has also ventured into radio, meaning uh, being able to control a radio. You can control a USRP, an RTL, SDR. Uh, you can control some of the uh, analog devices, uh, RFICs. Um, so you can order a SDR around. Um, I'm not sure if Octave has kept up with all of that stuff. Have, okay, and then there, I think there was a comment about the price. Um, so yes, if the retail to like a commercial entity uh, cost for all of this stuff can be many thousands of dollars, uh, you know, I, around about three thousand dollars for for MATLAB. However, if you're like me and you're using it for uh, for yourself at home, uh, non-commercial, and you're you're not using it uh, in in a school, like you're not uh, so not a, not an educational institution and not a not a company. It's one hundred and fifty dollars for the for the license for that's MATLAB and Simulink and all almost all of the toolboxes uh, like digital communications or RF or vehicular anything that you want to ex experiment with almost all of them are also available and they're discounted about that much so if you do have a couple of hundred dollars and you and you are looking for for something like MATLAB then that license is available that uh, that was something that a group of us in the in the community worked on so we we asked for it uh, and and got it. So. Okay. Well, thank you. I don't, any more, I don't see any more hands up. Barry? I'm looking and says. Oh, there was a comment the about the pattern it, is very impressive and omnidirectional. Yeah. The not, model. not, it's, it looks sort of omnidirectional. It sort of looks like a, it's a fat toroid. So it is. Very much like a dipole because you're starting with a dipole, and you're meandering the ends in, and you will you will be still getting uh, that that pattern. So that's what that and that's what we see when we we run it through the simulation. Okay. Anybody else out there got anything? Let's see. Can you test for gain? Yes, that's on the list when we. When we get the antenna back out, so we we've stowed it away for uh, house guests and and for other shenanigans. Uh, but yeah, the next time that we are going to uh, that, that yeah we're we're specifically looking for gain. There was some estimates of gain um, from from the antenna builder or antenna program. Let me page back up and look at that. So it's claiming, uh, it says, oh, you're going to get 1.8 dBi of gain. So it's, and that was, but that was at a, a frequency that was not where it wanted to be, it looks like. But yeah, one, it, the, the simulation said 1.8 dBi. So we'll, we'll measure it. Cool. Let's see, there's a question about max RF out. Uh, the... N5 ESE and one and a, and a couple of other folks that have that have given it a shot are using it um, with reasonable amounts of power. Uh, so far, we have not applied any more than than what we usually use for for tuning. Um, and then we but we tuned around and used it as a receive antenna when it was when it was outside that day. Um, I can't think of any reason why you would not want to apply. Power, the same reasonable amounts of power to it like the folks did in the past, except that uh, if you meandered it too short, because um, there is an IEEE paper about this design uh, from, and and he did manage to arc it. So, so you know, which if you if you look at a dipole and you look at how these things work, you can see that if you if you meandered it too close, you would you would get some some spark action there. So it's a it's another fun thing to to test. Let's see, a meander is another word for a trombone. I have seen that. That I think you're right. I saw that in some older IEEE papers. Trombone, a line stretcher. That's fun. Oh, okay, I get it now. I was wondering what it had to do with the trombone. I thought maybe it was just the curve from the trombone, but the, the trombone actually changes the uh, the length of the resonator, so. Let's see the what is the URL for the GitHub site? I'm gonna I'll I'll I will go ahead and no. type it in chat. They um, already posted it. Oh thank you. Thank you so much. I 
I guess I, I think I have replies collapsed in the in the chat then. Let's see, I'll check back up and see if there's any anything else. So, so an impedance match doesn't have to be the standard 50 ohm, right? Your impedance can be anything that you you need. I mean, we we tend to use 50 ohms. Um, so that's that's kind of what we were we were we were going for. The the tuner in the flex uh, would only tune this uh, where in a in a in a fairly narrow range. So that's why we we got out of what we call a real tuner, and uh, and the the inline meter so that we could see which way to go. Um, because as you can see from the chart, it's uh, it's it's got some excursions there. Um, so so I I mean, but I think it, someone definitely needs to correct me if I'm wrong. Since uh, you know, if 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 you if you want the impedance to be sixty or eighty or seventy, sure, you you know, you go ahead and you match it. Let's see. What were the SWR readings before using the tuner? They were they were definitely wrong. They were Hi, so it'll for the coax it would only work really around 23 megahertz so that was where it wanted to be it's got a, it has kind of a natural place where it wants to be but you really need to tune it need a good tuner in order to to use it on all those different bands oh yeah go ahead uh gene gene go ahead oh uh, yes <clears throat> The very start of the presentation, you uh, referred to this as like a, if I remember correctly, an apartment antenna. Is that correct? That's exactly what uh, the folks as far back as the 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 fellow from R RSGB were were out were aiming for. They wanted something that was compact uh, that would still work really well, and decided to attack it from a radiation resistance point of view. Uh, N5 ESE does design, you know, took this and built his antenna to take with him on the road. He was uh, traveling for work a lot, and he had a lot of downtime in the hotel room on these trips. So, you know, d d having to travel kind of can be a kind of a pain in the butt. But you know, having some some time uh, in the hotel room is good. And he just he wanted to see uh, would this work for a hotel room antenna, and it did. So his in his uh, so his papers and, and documentation, he describes in detail uh, how he would put it up temporarily in a hotel room. Okay. So, now, would the uh, the construction material of the building play a big uh, have a big effect upon the efficiency of the antenna? Yes, uh, any antenna is, is, is the stuff around it. If it's you know, so that that's true for a broad class of antennas. Um, People have noticed that this particular design with the uh, meandered dipole, uh, it is seems to be a little more sensitive to to noise, um, certain types of noise. Like like uh, N five ESE said, gosh, it just seems like it it uh, I could I could I can hear certain types of noise a little bit more. So we we put that down on the list of things to try to figure out is that uh, was it because he was listening for it, you know, because or 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 is it really true? It it is not. It it did, uh, but pretty much about as well as the 40, uh, 40 foot di uh, vertical in you know in the same yard. Uh, so so we were quite pleased when we saw that it was, uh, you know, about as good as that for, for something that's uh, you know, much much shorter than than what it would be if it was, uh, you know, all spread out as a dipole. Okay, so a hotel room next to the ice maker or the laundry <laughs> room would not be ideal. It wouldn't be ideal, but it's uh. It's getting you on the air when you're on the road, and he was very pleased with the performance and listed the contacts he made. So, so yeah, if you're if you're stuck in a hotel room and it's uh and you're inside of a Faraday cage, <laughs> you know, lots of chicken wire construction or I don't know ceramic tile roof with lots of metal in it. I mean, anybody that's come out traveled out west has probably encountered some of these buildings. Um, but that's true of any antenna, you know. All right, thanks a lot. Of course. Thank you, Gene. Anybody else? Yeah, it says uh, need toroids, and you be careful. You can set off fire alarms and water sprinklers. Yes, or uh, those touch lamps. Um, they <laughs> they can come on if you <laughs> transmit, <laughs> and it can it can make it make the place feel like it's haunted. Um, 
this happened on a de expedition once that was uh in a in a hotel in the south pacific and um the the uh, f fairly large uh de expedition uh, which all the antennas are of course outside and everything uh but the first real good run um turned off and on at random times all of the touch lamps in the entire hotel <laughs> and so they were scrambling around trying to figure out the hotel was trying to figure out what the heck was going on and and uh, we were all just busy making contacts and uh, we had to come to we had to negotiate an agreement on on what we would do or not do yeah it doubles as a bug zapper that it can uh you know you can you can definitely make antennas that uh, will allow you to enjoy uh the state sport of uh of georgia i have had first had experience of uh turning on a, a treadmill <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a really good talk from from DEFCON um, where an amateur radio operator uh, showed how you could um, you could you could run a GFI uh, ground fault indicator switch you know with with enough power on uh, seventy centimeters and then in the same talk referenced another uh, example uh, and it had a short film clip of, of using a, a Yagi, and I'm not sure at what frequency, to flip breakers on a neighbor's house uh, so, to turn off their annoying music. So there's all sorts of shenanigans that, that can be done with uh, with RF. And they want to have to pick up their reputations, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and then there's aerospace is experimenting with 3D printing antennas with silver paint onto structures. Uh, yeah, I, I did a paper for QEX. Um, Maybe 2018, 2017, about um, making a, a microwave antenna. So it's an ellipt elliptical taper horn for 10 gigahertz, and it's uh, printed in uh, polylactic acid or PLA because it's dimensionally stable. And then I used uh, MG Industries silver paint. So this is paint that's usually used like to reduce RFI. Uh, so if you've ever built a um, you know, uh, electric guitar, you might be familiar with it, but I used the high conductivity silver paint uh, and then did a whole bunch of uh, tests and it worked really well. So there's a there's a big 3D printing um, segment out there in, especially in microwave, because and the advantage of 3D printing is, is that it could make shapes like the elliptical taper is kind of hard to do if you're just going to try to machine it or bend it. Uh, but if you can type in you know the little little numbers, and it does take me somebody like me many tries to get the numbers to work out right. But once the numbers have worked out right and it makes your little STL, then you can print things that are really hard to machine uh, or hard to make. Yeah, small smaller wavelengths, small antennas. But yeah, the the uh, the there are three D printers that'll do metal. Um, I saw some uh, on a tour of JPL. Uh, when they, because they have an additive manufacturing lab uh, shop, and if you ever get a chance to go tour JPL, just take take them up on it. Just go to that, you know. And the three D printing of metal is pretty neat. However, that's super expensive still, so it's a real good compromise. It works really, really well um, to to print three D print and then metalize. You have to be somewhat careful. You can the spray paint is quite toxic and um, I managed to uh, on the on the drive home from buying spray paint, MG Industries spray paint. Um, somehow it leaked all over the back seat of the car, and that stuff does not come out. So, just be a little cautious with your paint. <laughs> I got a new antenna in the back seat to play with. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely reflective in the back seat. Yeah, it was uh, it was fun, but yeah, that's it's a it's a real active area. Uh, for prototyping, it's it's really super super helpful, and they the antennas act like metal ones. The those waves only care about the surface; they don't care that it's made out of plastic underneath. Yeah, the ham club seems really active. It, yeah, it's a good one. Is a, a, this activity oh. going on in Southern California? Is there what kind of activity? All this type of experimental activity going mm -hmm. on with clubs and companies and such in Southern Cal. I would say yes. There's a there's a lot of that uh, in like antenna experimentation here, uh, all up and down um, 
the the west coast there's a there's a lot of space companies and a lot of companies that supply space so uh, lots and lots of antenna designs for for space and they got you know like like jeremy points out aerospace has a uh, has really kind of picked this up and and run with it yeah it says the nasa f-18 project antenna on the the rudivator let's see and then troy asks how do you convince your landlord that the metallic snakes spray painted oh, metallic snakes spray paint on the roof are a natural phenomenon <laughs> uh well it's a, that's a good question there's there's so many tactics in negotiation you know um i i i, I i'm pretty sure that this group could probably come up with with at least a dozen good strategies to try to convince your landlord to to let you have an antenna yes including apple pie Yes, bribery works. Or gifts, I'm sorry. Gifts work. Well, this has been a great presentation, Michelle. As always, you do a great job. Oh, thank you. It's a, it's a ton of fun to work on, on antennas. Um, and I'm, I am not an HF expert or an antenna expert, uh, but the, the real power of amateur radio is that, you know, somebody like me can, can do this uh, I learn a ton, and then um, you know it's it's just looking at the history of of this particular design and um, all the wonderful work that's been done in the past. Uh, you know, it just it just really shows this is just the best hobby. <laughs> now, I just I have to say that Michelle is one of our main contributors to Rat Pack. She meets every Tuesday with us. We have a, a gang that get together, a team to figure things out. And a bunch of them are just like her, and they get going, and it is fun to listen to them. <laughs> I learn a lot every week. It's a really great group. Thank you very much, Dan, for, for making all this possible, l giving us a chance to meet up like this. Well, it's been my pleasure all the way through. It's been a real fun joyride. <laughs> it, it's not, well, this roller coaster, I guess you could call it a roller coaster. Every once in a while, we get a lot, somebody throws a, a log across the tracks. But uh, basically, it's a lot of fun. Okay, I don't see any more hands, and uh, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Yeah, if, um, let's see, somebody, somebody got the, the URL is okay. Yes. So, if, yeah, okay. Yeah, just drop by and, and visit us on the web uh, at openresearch.institute. And uh, there's a getting started page there. Uh, so, if you want to keep up with projects like this, or if you have an idea for something like a, an antenna project um, or feedback for this, uh, then yeah, just uh, we have a, an, an announcement mailing list and uh, a Slack and there's lots of other projects going on. So everyone is welcome. This is, <laughs> I'm not used to having to wrap these things up early, Michelle. Can you do that? <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> I really appreciate it, Dan. This is super fun. So I'll, I'll sign off and uh, yeah, just uh, anybody if you, again, if you're interested in anything like this, uh, just get in touch. Happy to hear from you. Okay. All right. I'll throw this out one more time. Do we got any questions, answers, comments? <laughs> Boy, this is a so uh oh. Dennis, watch out, world. Dennis is among us. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, yeah, I gotta make I, I, this is wonderful. Yeah, this is a great job. You know, we were talking about talking about this the other night when you got on the schedule, and and uh, this is really cool. So I just put a comment in there. It's like you could turn this into a multi-element. And oh, look at that! Oh, yeah. sorry, yeah, sorry, I missed that. That's a really good idea. Not, With some sort not, of an an array, an or... array or a yagi that would be rotatable, and you know, definitely have gain. It would be a very compact yagi. There's all kinds of. You know, compact Yagi designs using capacity hats and things like that. But this is interesting. This is okay. An interesting design. Yeah, let me. Um, I think there actually is a way to take a, an antenna model. So now that there, so like a, it's an object in MATLAB, mm -hmm. um, which is nice. So you can just then refer to it just by its variable name. So the current model. What I'll do, um, you know, before before our Rat Pack planning meeting. Uh, next Tuesday, I'll see what happens when I put it in an into an array because there's an array 
antenna array function and then uh, see what see yeah. what the pattern does i bet you it'll look pretty interesting so i'll bring that i'll bring that to you i'll put it in the repo that's, too that's cool that's cool. that's a great, great idea stuff. great presentation thank you thank you all right yeah no, believe it or not we actually get some planning done in the planning meeting <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of this going on <laughs> <laughs> very good all right y'all thanks so much well thank you michelle and we'll see you next tuesday if not before you bet and uh well we it's well in about 10 minutes early here which is very unusual for us but those on the east coast that would bring late right now would be very appreciative about that unless we have something more yeah uh, i could break into a i could break into a song and dance routine no, that that's okay. We appreciate the thought, though, Gene. <laughs> okay, if you change your mind, let me know. We will. We will. You'll be the first to know. <laughs> okay, folks. Uh, I'm going to start getting ready to pull the plug here. We have another presentation tomorrow, Thursday night. Same place, same channel. <laughs> I think there's a TV show like that now in the 50s. But at any rate, we do use the same URL. And uh, we do uh, to get any things. We meet every time on the same night. So uh, you can make a shortcut in your desktop if you wanted to. Just click on it at the time, uh, appropriate time, and join us. You're welcome to do that. With all this nonsense, I'm going to say 73 to everybody. Appreciate everybody being here. And for those that's going to see you tomorrow, see you tomorrow. 73. You, you got to put in a plug for tomorrow's talk. <laughs> <laughs> hey, go ahead that's right go ahead shake out yeah we're gonna we're gonna be talking about shake out and how to uh how to participate in the great shake out of 2023 so we'll have a lot of information about that tomorrow night make a quickie what is uh shake out it is uh thursday october 19th at 10 19 a.m local time and if you're a WinLink user, you want to check into Rat Pack tomorrow night. Yet, even if you're not a WinLink user, you still want to check into Rat Pack tonight because we want to get as many hams participating in ShakeOut as we possibly can. So that's the goal. Okay. Well, thank you. And I like to remind everybody these videos, we've got over 300 now or something like that. There's a bunch of them out there. They're for your use. If you use them in your clubs, put them on your websites, whatever. That's what they're for. They're free of charge and uh, uh, don't have to ask permission. Just don't use them. <laughs> we don't want any fake information added. So 73 is everyone and uh, see you next go round.